first of all, I think they are the expression of the ability of the Italian companies to make quality, to produce quality, to offer quality to the consumers, regardless of the fact that they are in the American continent or they are in the Asian continent. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia Falco-Bekali. In today's episode, we are going to look at the power of brands. What does it take to establish a brand? What does it take to scale a brand, enter a completely new market? What does it take for a brand, once established, to really be resilient in times of crisis, such as the COVID-19 crisis we have right now across the globe? Well, there are many, many questions, and I thought, let's keep it specific. And specific in the sense that we're going to look at Italy. Made in Italy is a huge brand, a well-beloved brand, a brand and a country that basically um, exports more than 540 billion US dollars worth of goods every single year. The biggest market, taking almost 10% of that share, is the US market. So I thought, okay, who better to invite than Antonino Laspina. He is the newly appointed US Trade Commissioner and Executive Director of the Italian Trade Agency. Antonino, thank you so much for joining us here on Mentory TV. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you also for the presentation that you have done of the Italian uh, situation in the world trade and the what the Italian trade agency is doing in the States. Well, let's kick it straight off with the status quo of Made in Italy. Uh, Antonino, I read an interview with you where you said that the Italian brand needs relaunching. What is the status quo right now of the Italian brand across the globe? Relaunching means that uh, we have, and we are, thanks God, we are only fully aware of that. We are working now into a new scenario and we are going to be ready for what is called the new normal. So brands that have been able to emerge in the past and they've been, uh, uh, they become iconic in terms of uh, Italian lifestyle. Uh, they have been uh, brands and uh, uh, companies that even starting 100 years ago, starting 20 years ago, they've been able to become a symbol of a certain uh, Italian lifestyle, which is uh, a combination of uh, tradition, innovation, uh, but first of all, I think they are the expression of the ability of the Italian companies to make quality, to produce quality, to offer quality to the consumers, regardless of the fact that they are in the American continent or they are in the Asian continent. So they've been able to cope with a, a huge, you know, uh, problems in terms of size and dimensions because uh, we have seen in the last 30, 40 years different phenomena. For, for instance, like uh, the recent one, the internationalization, the globalization. There was the time that everybody was saying, uh, even, a, you know, big specialists of the trade, they were saying that uh, there was no more space for small companies. There was no space for anything that was, uh, you know, different from, uh, from a big corporation. And nevertheless, we saw this uh, family-owned companies, small companies, to become leaders in, uh, in uh, many different fields, occupying uh, sometimes not only the niche of the market, but also big market share. So this has been, this has been uh, uh, I think, fantastic. Now it's a new scenario. What we have to do is to help the Italian companies to become fit in order to cope with the new problems. Yes, and um, before we get into you know, the new normal under COVID-19, which seems to be you know, really the reality going forward for quite some time, let me quickly backtrack on what you were just saying, and that is the USP of Italian companies, Italian products, is quality. Now, quality is a value to you and I, to many people uh, in Europe, but there are different markets where quality might not necessarily be the main reason why they buy one product. It might be the pricing of the product. It might be just the availability of the product. How do you really establish a market with that in mind saying, yes, we might be 
high level. We might be a bit more costly, but quality is something that you need and you need it from an Italian company. How do you establish that? Well, I think that in the, in the Italian experience, because of course I'm not going to deny that we can find quality in other you know, competitors in other countries, but there is what I call the Italian way to the quality. There is an Italian way of uh, perfecting the goods, moving from what was the Italian tradition in the craftsmanship. And the Italian companies, uh, if you want to have uh, and had in the past and still have, this ability of uh, uh, combining this craftsmanship of the, of the past, the experience that they have accumulated in doing things, with what is now the technology, what is now the innovation, uh, which means that if the company was good in making shoes, now they've been able to combine the digital in order to sell the shoes, but also they adopted the technology, the appropriate technology in order to design the shoes in the proper way. Which means that uh, by combining this, they have achieved what is perceived as the top of the quality. Because there is, a, in this way of doing things, of manufacturing this, there is the, uh, an attitude, uh, let us say, an inner attitude of doing things for the market in order to help the consumers to find the proper goods for them. Uh, let's talk about, for instance, clothes, uh, shoes. You know, in the past, there was a kind of rigidity in offering certain kind of uh, products. You know, there was a collection that was very, very much rigid, if we say, not flexible. Well, the Italian companies, due to this flexibility they have in the process of manufacturing the goods, they have introduced a lot of inno innovative things. I remember, for instance, the time that Benetton was able to make a revolution in the knitwear because they were offering every two weeks, three weeks, different products, different colors. So this is the flexibility, but it's also a kind of ability to look at what the market is demanding and adjusting continuously. This is, I think, is the, the, the top, uh, the sense of the quality that we can introduce in the market and we can continue to give to the customers. Yeah, and I think this is an interesting point because what you were saying is you combine the traditional way of doing, of manufacturing that product, really, most of the time in a small or medium-sized business, often family-owned, but you can scale it up in terms of quantity because you get the digital, uh, you get all the technology behind you in order to really scale and bring it close to the consumer now you were you were just uh, also mentioning that it is not easy to establish your brand in, in the US for example let's be specific because you are now in the US market a couple of questions in my mind a is there still room I mean Italy is so present in the US to increase the made in Italy brand and also the opportunity for Italian companies to move in is there more is there enough room and secondly you know, companies such as Zab, Suzuki, Carrefour, uh, Tesco's, they try, they put millions if not billions in investment to really advertise what they had and they didn't make it in the American market. Your, your analysis, why? Well, I think if we go uh, and talk about this, the big players of the distribution, my idea is that uh, uh, you have to adjust to the American model. So we know that the distribution in Europe is uh, totally different from what is, and even certain scheme of interaction with the customers are completely different from what is uh, uh, made by a big American group and this, let's say, the European you know, tradition of the uh, distribution of food and other goods. So I think that uh, although this is not something that we can, uh, uh, you know, say, uh, it, in a, in a hundred percent and be sure that this was the, but my idea is that they did not uh, get in touch with uh, the right formula for the American market. So they withdrew and uh, they did, they thought that the European scheme, the European model could be adapted uh, or absorbed by the American style. Uh, in the case of Italian goods, we are not distributing goods uh, through these big players. Uh, we always have said that Italy has no big companies in distribution. We have no big group in uh, hotel. 
And uh, this has been, if you want, an handicap. But in certain cases, this was also a, a powerful you know, tool for the Italian companies to find out alternative distribution system that have made possible for the Italian companies to position in what we call the top of the range, the top quality, identifying uh, more and more um, the personal touch of the buyers, of the, even uh, in the case of the distributions, the distribution was always paying very much attention to the Italian product because it was not a mass product. So they had to combine, even if, supposing you had a, a specialty store of shoes for ladies, uh, the idea was not to get in a you know, huge quantity of shoes that after all the Italian companies were not able to manufacture. Mm -hmm. But it was the ability of combining the shoes that were suitable for the target of the people that you had in mind. So combining shoes from the different districts that we have in Italy, shoes that are, you know, intended for sophisticated ladies. And then you could combine with the casual shoes, uh, shoes for the, let's say, the fashionista or the traveler, the ballerinas. Yeah. So this has been the... The approach, that the way the American people have seen at the Italian goods, a selection, the possibility of making selection of top quality, combining together, but never having in mind the quantity. Mm. Quality came first for the Italian companies, and I think quality is in the mind of the American buyers when they look at the Italian product. Well, and the, the local sensitivity you're talking about, essentially, Antonino, I wonder, I mean, the American market is huge. And I wonder, can one really approach it as one market or do we have to look at it as 50 different markets? Do we have to say, okay, the New York market with a new consumer is totally different than the one in Houston, Texas, than the one in Miami, than the one in Seattle? Yes, in fact, uh, one of the, uh, I think, most important point that I have been uh, highlighting since the, my arrival here is the fact that there is one market, but there are different targets. So the market is certainly is the U.S. market in terms of regulation, in terms of general trends, mega trends. But it's, uh, um, it's, it's also to be considered that uh, we have a, 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 a nation that is a continent. Being a continent, we have also... The, the trends uh, that are influenced by the weather, for instance. Yeah. When it's uh, almost winter in one area, is still, you know, uh, springtime, summer in some areas. So I think what we have to do it from here is coming now the great uh, uh, range of opportunities for the Italian companies, is the ability of moving out of the traditional area where we have been able to introduce our goods, and starting with a specific strategies to go into Florida, for instance, where we know that the consumption of clothes and shoes, they are completely different from what is yes, in, in Chicago, you know? And at the same time, I think the California uh, way of life and lifestyle is completely different from what is in uh, and and shorts. That's all you need in sunny California, right? And maybe a top. Exactly. So this is where what, what we have to start having in mind. But at the same time, we need to think more about the the, the big uh, metropolitan areas. So it's not a matter of state for me. It's a matter of. Uh, metropolitan areas. It's not a matter of California. It's a matter of Houston, Dallas, Austin, uh, San Antonio, Minneapolis, Indianapolis. This is what we have to look at. So doesn't it uh, still, um, isn't it still val valid um, that song, New York, New York, New York by Frank Sinatra, Antonino? If you make it there, you make it everywhere. Isn't New York the classic launch pad, the kind of, okay, we try our brand out here and if it flies in New York, they are so spoiled, they are so selective, uh, they know when they like something and they go for it before we scale out to the U.S. Does that not apply anymore? My idea is that uh, New York, New York is still there. Uh, but you have to consider this not simply as a market. Everything is not or is not anymore in New York is it happening. What is important in New York is that must be the platform, must be the entry point, the launching pad 
from here, once you are landing in New York, you have to analyze the market and see that maybe for certain kind of products, you cannot consider all the 50 states of the uh, federal you know, state. You have to say, okay, my product is this one, and in combination with a potential partner, you have to define a strategy that is going to put you, for instance, uh, concentrating in the sun belt if your product is responding to a certain lifestyle, even if, if you want in terms of food, for instance. There are areas where certain kind of food can be much more accepted by the people rather than the others. So once you land, and supposing that is still the landing pad is New York, what is important is that from there, with our help, with the partners, we have to help the Italian companies to define if you are manufacturing, you know, uh, very light shoes, you are not specialized in boots, then maybe it's useless to go in the northern part of the states. But it's maybe good to have a strategy for the southern part of the states, the beach area. This is what I think is important. So the market is there, but there are different targets and different strategies that should be applied. And that is so important. You mentioned local partners. I know from the little uh, exposure to China that what you need if you want to scale in China and really place your product, what they call the crocodiles, the local crocodiles, so the local key partners that have their network and help you introduce, but not only introduce, but really land, you know, kind of create the scale of where and how the actual strategy is that something that is fundamental even for big brands, brands like the Gucci or Tim Ennell, Kinder, Ferrari, brands that have been established for so, so many years, that they need to respect that? So if you want this, uh, the, the success of this big brand is confirming, if you want the strategy that should be applied to the market, you have to be, to think at the federal level and have a strategy for the, for the nation, for the country. And at the same time, you have to understand what kind of model, what kind of product are more accepted in one area rather than the other area. Uh, you cannot uh, you know, offer the same kind of products. This is, uh, as I mentioned, even for furniture design, we know that in some areas there is, a, there is still a tradition of, uh, you know, a combination of uh, traditional style, modernized, but still there is an appreciation for uh, the traditional materials while we know that in some areas of the states there is uh, the minimalist approach there is the design approach so I, I think that for italian companies this is the way certain models we know of, of products can be accepted uh, in a much better in some areas rather than the others but the strategy is a national strategy why one thing that should be clear for the italian companies is that you you don't have to be successful in the States if you are successful in 20 states. You are successful in the States if you are successful where you are able to get the market share that is appropriate for your products. So because of that, we, we are going to move our operations in terms of uh, promotional activities and seminars, education training, and so and so. As I said, not anymore in the traditional areas, but we are adding, as I said, a couple, maybe 12 new areas, new metropolis, where we understand and we have analyzed there are all the conditions for the Italian goods to be accepted. And these conditions are basically uh, three. There are many other conditions, but what we think are fundamental for our penetration is this one. First of all, we need a metropolitan area. Metropolitan area means uh, area where the people can move, can exchange opinion. So there is a free uh, flow of uh, uh, lifestyles. So the people can contaminate, you know, each other. And this is very important. The second one is high education. The Italian products basically are not uh, the response to a particular basic need. They are going to satisfy feelings, aspiration, dreams, everything that is, you know, yeah. going to be related to some kind less of... Less tangible values, less tangible values. Exactly. So this is what we need. With a, very, very often, this, you need a high education because 
means that you don't have to be, you know, every day, you know, dealing with the problems. And this is, unfortunately, this is the situation. But we know that wherever there are these conditions, the people are much more interested in going for quality and going for goods that go, for instance, goods that are uh, expression of brands because the brand is the certification of the quality. So we know that is not just a nice name like the Chinese have been thinking for many years that simply putting a very nice name, you can become a brand. Brand is a certification that the market gives to a product because for 20, 30, 40 years, you have been satisfying the needs of your customers. The people have not been complaining about a belt, have not been complaining about a jewel, have not been complaining about shoes and so on. And the third factor is, of course, the, the money in the pocket of the people. Now we know that uh, the distribution of wealth in the states is not, of course, uniform, but we know that there are some uh, uh, sanctuaries of wealth. And, and this is where we have to identify. So when I have to give the answer to, there are still opportunities for the Italian goods to expand the penetration in the state, I would say yes. And this, regardless of the fact that we are going into a new normal. Why? Because the people are going to look once again for these products. What is going to change is the scheme of the distribution. The scheme of the distribution means that there will be a physical distribution or at least a physical, let's say, presentation. So even is not going to be indispensable, like in the past, to have a physical distribution, but the physical distribution is necessary in some new areas because the people have to touch the goods. They have to, they have to get the idea of what they are buying, you know. And this is very important. And then, of course, you can distribute by, by a digital tool. This is the combination, physical and digital. Yeah, and this is so important because I think a brand, apart from what you were saying, consistent, good performance, not for a year, not for a couple of years, but decades, is what builds the brand and makes it also resilient in times of crisis. The other thing is the experience. Now, uh, in Introducing a product into a market, fairs are very important, of course. Exhibitions are very important, where people are coming, touching, getting the feel of it, understanding what quality really means and how different it can feel, let's say, in terms of fashion, uh, when you put it on, or how different it, it tastes in terms of food. Now, you talked about the new normal, or things are shifting a little bit. Let's stay with the COVID-19 crisis and try to see how this can actually become a creation and opportunity also for companies to scale up their business in the US. Let's say fairs are going to be very difficult in the future. What is the alternative there? How do we get that same level of trust? The, how can we replace the touching of the goods with still being able to maintain, if not create, a really strong brand in the US? Well, this, uh, we are going to find out some solutions. Some are within our scheme, with our operation, within uh, the, the activity of the trade agency. Some, of course, are going to be uh, solutions that we are developing together with the fair uh, organizers. And uh, since Italy was the country that was participating in, on, in almost every fair exhibition in food, uh, design, furniture, and uh, jewelry, and so on. Uh, there are this kind of, of, of operational scheme that we are going to exp experiment. The first one is within our structure, and this is the platform Extra Ita Style. Extra Ita Style is a very totally new platform, is a concept of having a platform where the Italian companies uh, are going to make registration, and they will be uh, able to develop uh, what we call the uh, a virtual you know presentation we have given them a, a certain scheme for the presentation a high resolution uh, movie for instance high resolution pictures um, and they will be there for a certain period at the same time we are going to make uh, the american uh, buyers sensitive and informed about this platform and pushing them, you know, or pulling, if you want them, into the, you know, visiting this kind of a platform. And from there, 
there will be the chance for a B2B connection. So what we are doing is basically a digital event on a scale that it can be operated by the trade agency. Up to now, we have made possible for 100 companies. The companies now are, you know, registering. They are preparing the high-resolution, you know, material. So we are training them. We think that in a couple of weeks, we could start. Uh, the registration has been so successful that maybe we have to expand the number of the companies that will be allowed. But we knew this since the beginning. The fact that this is an experiment at the initial phase, as you know, you have to be very cautious. The same model on a very and very wide scale is going to be applied by the uh, collaboration of the Italian trade agency with affairs organizers. And for instance, I can say that the master project, that this affair, that is a physical fair for the men's suits, uh, menswear, is going to be held on a digital uh, uh, basis. Base, but this time the platform is going to be offered by the fair organizers. So the most reactive of the fair organizers are, you know, setting up this kind of platform and they are trying to make the registration with the traditional system. There will be an Italian pavilion, there will be the companies within an Italian pavilion, and at a certain period we will try to make this kind of, uh, you know, let's say digital fair, okay? What is interesting for the digital fair is that this is not going to stop, you know, like a physical fair, the day that, you know, shut down everything and people are going back to the country. You can keep this platform open for two months, three months after the events until there is the new collection. So this is going to be, I think, something new that my idea is that in the new normal, we are going to keep alive in any case which means that even at the time that we are going to have a physical fair, supposing that in the future, uh, we hope so, in the springtime, there will be a physical fair, this tool of the digital fair is going to be, you know, a complement for yeah. the yeah. physical fair. And this is, I think, is going to be a kind of positive heritage that we are going to have from this season of the COVID-19 that is going to help us. In fact, we had some experiments in this. But in certain way, the Italian companies, or I think companies all around the world, they were not forced, you know, to adopt this scheme. Now, since there is the necessity, what is this? Uh, the, the effect is that there has been an acceleration, a speed up of this, the adoption of this digital tools. And if you want, this is a positive uh, yeah. uh, fact that we are going to have as a positive heritage of this uh, uh, tragic uh, period. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is, uh, that you're building that, that platform to stay and to last for the long term is tremendously important. And I think it's educational on both sides for the creator and the companies, but also for us consumers or buyers for any kind of um, you know, retail outlet that we have to start through digital, still uh, understand the quality, still understand the USP of that particular product, why I should take it in without having the experience of actually touching it and then creating my own feelings and experiences with it. Antonino, let's just wrap up this first part of our conversation. We'll be back in a minute.